Hello, everyone. Um, as re requested and uh, as uh, noted, I was going to record this presentation that I gave at the Cocoa chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society regarding Everglades restoration and water quality. So let's get started. So historically, the Everglades um, uh, pre-human involvement during the wet season, which typically is during the summer here in Florida, uh, the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes in the Central Florida area would essentially fill up and eventually, uh, if it was wet enough, those lakes would overflow and flow through the creeks and, and, and rivers in the northern part or the central part of Florida into Lake Okeechobee and eventually down the peninsula into South Florida and out into Gulf of Mexico and Florida Bay. Associated with that was um, a natural flowing ecosystem of uh, wetland vegetation essentially south of Lake Okeechobee. So here you see kind of a general <laughs> um, vegetation distribution of you know a swamp forest at the south end of Lake Okeechobee uh, flowing into a sawgrass plain um, and eventually down into the, the mangrove fringe. Now humans came in and mucked that all up. We, we decided to dike, dam, and bridge, um, and you know, dig canals to uh, redirect the flow. And we, we redirected the flow essentially out to east and west coasts through uh, the Coosahatchee and St. Lucie estuary, uh, limited the flow to the Everglades itself, um, and, and vastly diminished the flow to Florida Bay and Gulf of Mexico. Quick shout out to Everglades Foundation for these uh, animations. They did a wonderful job and uh, definitely want to share that. Uh, so with this change in vegetation and with the change in the installation of infrastructure, the uh, historic Everglades was uh, essentially cut and compartmentalized. So we still have some of the same vegetation distribution albeit very limited. Um, but yeah, we do have some sawgrass uh, expanses, some tree islands, but it's, it's markedly smaller. Um, so the, the figure to all the way to the left is the free drainage uh, map, kind of the, the animation I showed the first one. The middle one is essentially the current flow, the previous slide. And ultimately we found out that this is not a great position to be in. The ecosystem is you know, uh, severely impacted. It's not functioning the way you want it to. So uh, we decided, the collective we decided that we wanted to restore that flow and restore, essentially restore the ecosystem to some remnant there of, of the historic Everglades. You know, we can't go completely back to it in time, but we can at least try to help with, with what exists and restore it. Uh, some components of the ecosystem. And to do that, we essentially have to focus on the quality, the quantity, the timing, and the distribution of water throughout the ecosystem. And that's a very, that's like the cornerstone tenet of this comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. Some of you may have heard of CERP or, or the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. Um, it's been around for a while. It's been, um, it's a huge program. Uh, lots of agencies involved, lots of money. So, how we're going to restore our quality, quantity, and timing for distribution is through a series of projects. And these projects include storage, treatment, conveyance, and distribution of water. So, as I as I introduced, we have the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, or CERT. Uh, the actual plan, the little picture to the right there, is, a, is one of the the volumes of what's called the Yellow Book, um, it embodies what is SERP. It's multiple volumes, billions of pages, um, lots of really great information in it, but it's essentially the plan to get us back on track. It was authorized back in 2000, um, and the initial cost was $7.8 billion. billion would have been. Um, in it, it has 68 individual projects. That's uh, quite a few, if you ask me. With about a 30 year implementation window, so it's going to take about, hypothetically, it was going to take about 30 years to build out. Um, and there's 
the four vein projects um, are essentially two types of storage, water management advance, and there's actually a um, you know a bulleted sub bulleted a fifth project that might be treatment as well. And this project, this plan, is essentially a state federal cost share. So that means the state would chip in some money and the federal government, i.e. unemployment of the year, will chip in the other half um, to be able to construct all these projects. So one of those projects, one of the storage projects, the underground store, water storage is uh, aquifer storage and recovery. And here's a uh, kind of a, a graphic that really illustrates what uh, ASR, aquifer storage and recovery is. And so we, if you look at a cross section of um, our geology here in South Florida, we have um, kind of the superficial aquifer. That's the, the aquifer right there at the immediate surface. We have a confining layer of some sort. Then we have a, another aquifer, and this is the one that we store in. And then we have a lower compressor. And so essentially there's a pocket underground that we're able to uh, utilize and store water. The idea is that during the wet season, when we have a bunch of water on the landscape, we're able to recharge that aquifer. So we're able to put water down there and um, fill that space. During the dry season, when water is lower during drought, we're able to pull from that, that aquifer um, because there's water stored down there. We put it down there and we're going to get it back and use some portion thereof. And what a project of this magnitude looks like is something uh, along the lines of the Kissimmee River ASR, where it's essentially just a, a big pump that uh, we bring water in from a, a water body, in this case, Kissimmee River. Um, some level of treatment, so there's a filter or UV um, treatment, and then it's put down into to the aquifer. Now, when it's recovered, some portion of the initial flush. Uh, doesn't get immediately discharged, it goes to a, a holding pond, which you can see here in the pond, and then uh, discharge out to an area to, to use it. One great benefit of this is that um, if we put the water down into the aquifer, it's not going to be lost from the, uh, you know, during storage, there's, no, there's not going to be any loss from evaporation, which can be substantial as well. Another component is above ground storage. Now this um, this big, this picture here is of the LH flow utilization basin in, in uh, West Palm, Florida. Now granted, it doesn't look like an above ground, and actually technically it isn't. It's an old rock line um, where uh, an aggregate company was mi mining the rock for lime rock. And it was the perfect size, essentially, for uh, a reservoir in this region. So uh, the state of Florida acquired it um, uh, and put it to that need. Uh, this project specifically covers about 800 acres. It's about 55 feet deep and provides a pretty good amount of storage. Um, there is some infrastructure that uh, was installed, including pump stations, but for the most part, uh, this is a type of storage that uh, is, you know, quote unquote, above ground, you know, which particularly when it's um, that is utilized through uh, SERP as well as other restoration projects. Another component, another storage option, I guess you can call it, is dispersed water management. The South Florida Water Management District has a dispersed water management project uh, program. It essentially uh, allows landowners, which uh, don't use a partial land uh, per se, to be able to provide storage to um, the water management district. And here on this map, you can see there's a bunch of uh, different pink shaded areas. Some are hashed, as in meaning that they're planned. Some are solid, as in they're complete and they're actually storing water today. Um, and they're sprinkled out throughout the, uh, the watershed here um, with some, uh, you know, being uh, put online as you see. So along with all this storage, we also have treatment. Now treatment is you know, kind of a broad term that uh, is thrown around a lot, but there's a lot of components within it. So 
the first and easiest component is source control. This is something that uh, we can, it's a very uh, modest slice of the pie that we're able to get to very quickly. And so this is something that was initially focused on very early on in the education project. And so that includes stormwater management. So, uh, you know, stormwater ponds and communities, for instance, uh, as well as uh, stormwater sewer inlet cleaning, agricultural best management practices, other small things that contribute uh, largely to clean the water. The other component is stormwater treatment areas at both the regional and sub regional scales. So, for source control, source control is a really important uh, component as well as treatment. And here's a quick uh, figure showing essentially a cumulative load through uh, a, a set of structures down in the Everglades. And there's two different colors, colored lines here. We have the blue line, which is pre stormwater treatment area and best magic practices, so pre FPA DMP. And then there's a orangey color uh, line that is post, so after we constructed FPAs and implemented DMP. And you can see there's a dashed line going uh, up the, the plot there. And if we didn't implement SDAs and DMPs, ultimately that blue line would keep following that dashed line and the cumulative load would keep getting higher and higher and higher. That's something we didn't want to collectively mean that we're, you know, we're loading the ecosystem. Now we implemented SDAs and DMPs and that the slope of that line changed significantly, uh, which is a good thing. That's what we wanted. Another way to look at that is if you look at uh, phosphorus loads with DMPs and without them. And, uh, this is kind of a model equation uh, based on um, essentially runoff within the Everglades agricultural area. And so we have since uh, about 1995 data to current, and you can see that um, that the separation between those two points with and without DMPs is actually you know, growing. Um, this is a cumulative load from, from these, uh, these different categories. And to date, well, we have almost 4,000 metric tons uh, accounted for, removed, I guess you can call, prior to discharge, uh, which is actually a pretty huge uh, uh, amount, considering that this is just a small piece of the pie. We'll get to the bigger piece of the pie. Later. As I mentioned, stormwater treatment areas, we, we uh, the concept of stormwater treatment areas is essentially we utilize or leverage Mother Nature to do some work for us. So we can construct uh, treatment wetlands that um, that are natural wetlands that are you know, constructed and, and managed to be able to remove nutrients. In this case, phosphorus. And here's just a general figure showing uh, water coming in. You have emergent plants that's taking uh, phosphorus as well as submergent plants, and then you have sun settling. But ultimately, the end goal is or the end result is a reduction in phosphorus uh, leaving the plant. And so, what does that look like? Here we have on the top left, we have kind of an emergent system where there's uh, vegetation, emergent vegetation, spreading uh, throughout, and the the next two plots or the next two figures here, you, you can see that this is like a submergent system of like water lily era, um, which are two submergent plants uh, that are common within the estuary. So As I mentioned, uh, here's a couple examples of, of emergent plants. We have the infamous cattail, uh, which is uh, a great nutrient producer. We also have sawgrass and spikegrass. These are three examples of emergent vegetation that are in our stormwater as well. So some some submergent aquatic vegetation examples. We have musk muskrat, tara, coontail, southern naiad. There's also spining naiad, hydrilla, which actually is um, it's considered invasive, but it does a, a pretty good job of removing nutrients. And it's not like we uh, we don't propagate it, it's just it's there. So we leverage what's there. We also have pondweeds, ladder woods, a bunch of uh, other vegetation that help move nutrients within um, the rest. Another um, project type, I guess you can call it, is the conveyance and distribution of water within the other place. So, one really great example 
is um, uh, removing impediments to flow. One of those is the Tamiami Trail. So if you've ever visited Florida and you've driven from uh, Naples or Tampa all the way over to Miami, most likely you would have driven uh, down US 41 for Tamiami Trail. Uh, historically, Tamiami Trail uh, essentially was a, uh, was, a, was a levee with a couple of culverts through it um, across the Everglades. And so it was a, a huge impediment to flow. Now, um, now today, we have bridging in certain portions of, of Tamiami Trail to where there's uh, essentially bridges over it and allowing more water to flow into the Everglades, so reducing that impediment to flow. Here's an older figure kind of showing uh, the spanning of the bridges. So here we have down here in the south of Everglades National Park to the north, we have our uh, water conservation area PA. And you can see in this uh, inset map, here's Miami and here's Naples. Um, so you can kind of get some sense of uh, orientation. The, as I said, this map is a little outdated. Here it says it's currently under construction. This is actually complete. This is a one mile stretch of bridge that allows uh, water to flow from, water from a canal. Uh, uh, Borough Canal south of uh, Water Conservation Agency into Everglades National Park. Um, the other section here is funded for an additional 2.6. This has actually been completed and water is currently flowing under these bridges here. Um, other projects include uh, road raising, so elevating the road a little bit so that we can have higher water within the canal that Borough Canal I mentioned. And then there's also some plans for other stretches of bridges. I'm not 100% sure of the status of those plans at this point. I can only try to find that information. Here's a couple pictures of showing uh, this is actually uh, that one mile stretch of bridge is complete. This is kind of what it looks like. What's really cool about it is if you drive up and over it, uh, it feels like you're flying over the Everglades. You can see uh, all the tree islands. And here's actually a picture of when they opened uh, or, or essentially removed that road, the Tamian, old Tamian Trail, um, for that 2.6 mile bridge. So here's the water that's actually flowing in it. It was super exciting. That, that was a great milestone and something that's uh, bringing forward for this bridge. So another conveyance uh, project, I guess, is with, uh, they call it the decompartmentalization physical model. And essentially that's what it is, it's a physical model to be able to understand how uh, yeah. the ecosystem responds to decompartmentalizing the ecosystem. So with all those canals and levees and dikes, we've essentially made pockets of ecosystem, uh, or pockets within the ecosystem. And so um, this project here, uh, the S-152, for instance, um, sorry, um, we, uh, it's, it's essentially a structure through the levee. And here's a picture of it. This is the levee, this is the structure, and there's a canal there. That's that, that, that looks blue like here. And here's a picture of some fluorescent dye that, um, that was released to understand the flow patterns from fish structures, uh, essentially southeast, uh, so the direction of the arrow. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the quality, quantity, and timing. Now I'm going to focus on, you know, now we have a general understanding of what the storage, treatment, conveyance, and distribution projects kind of look like and, and what their flavors are. I want to focus on uh, some, some successes as well as uh, some, some of the data associated with the Kinney River restoration project, Lake of the Chobe, the stormwater treatment areas, as I mentioned and the Coosahatchee or C-43 uh, canal. So essentially the, the west, western uh, discharge from, from the river. So moving right into it here is uh, essentially the Kissimmee River Valley. And so we have uh, this project here is the Kissimmee River Headwater uh, Revitalization Project, which is actually complete. It involves um, essentially improving stormwater uh, and uh, management of the lakes up there. And if, uh, if anybody's ever visited Florida, you probably uh, know of 
Kissimmee or Orlando, that's a great industry area. So the next project is the Kissimmee River uh, restoration project, which is this uh, stretch here. So this, uh, for some reason, we thought it was a great idea to straighten out a river back historically. After we straightened it out, we really realized that it wasn't really that good of an option. It wasn't great. Um, and you know, we had issues associated with that. And so over the past uh, 20, 30 years, we've been re-meandering the river into a semi-natural semi um, And also the, the last project here is this is a project area for the lake that should be watershed project, which has several components outlined for SERP. Um, and it's expected to shovel out, uh, shovel done uh, 2030. Um, so altogether, these three projects, we have a combined benefit of substantial storage, as well as nutrient removal, and of course, uh, Here's another uh, map of the Kissimmee River restoration. This is the lower uh, portion of the Kissimmee River restoration where we have uh, several phases here, phase one, phase two, three, and four. Um, for perspective, you know, this is essentially um, a portion of, of the river that's been restored. You can see this is the historic remnant. Well, this is the, the Straightened Kissimmee River, and this is actually the uh, re meandered part and, and re diversion of, of that flow. Here's another example. Here's a picture from the 1950s of the Kissimmee River. Here in 2013, you can see the remnant uh, channel that was dug, and then this is the re meandering. So you can see that uh, portions of the river are definitely. Getting back to the natural flood conditions. Again, here's another map showing uh, essentially what encompasses the Kissimmee River Basin. So, up here is the upper Kissimmee uh, River Basin, um, the Kissimmee Basin. This is where all the lakes are. This is where the revitalization project really happened. Uh, this is the lower Kissimmee River Basin. This is where the straight or the free meandering of the river occurred. And we have some phosphorus data associated with that. So the blue, so this is total phosphorus flow rate in the intact and it's a time series from uh, May 1st, 1994, all the way to April 30th, 2018. And we're, we're, this is uh, based on annual Varna water year. Um, so you can see there's the blue squares is the upper Kissimmee River Basin for those three containers. And then the red dots are the lower Kissimmee River Basin, which is the discharges from these two basins. And you can see that one of these is obviously not like the other, and there are some definite issues. The lower Kissimmee River has um, significant nutrient leaving the ecosystem that at this point we're going into Lake of the Turtles. Now, granted, this isn't great. But all the projects that are involved, uh, including some local initiatives, are working to be able to get this red dot to these blue squares at least initially. And then eventually everything will lower because these concentrations are really high, especially for the ecosystem. And so yeah, it, it's not great, but we're also working on it. One thing to note, this extreme spikiness um, actually coincides with tropical storms. And so here, for instance, if anybody's remember Hurricane Irma, um, this is from Irma, this is a, a significant learning event that um, you know, kind of really mucked things up for a lot of the ecosystem because it was so devastating. And these other spikes also correspond to crazy storms or uh, crazy rain events. And crazy is the topic of the by the way. So, so if anybody's paid attention to the news or um, has been involved with Everglades in any sense of the word, you've heard of the Hoover River Dyke uh, Rehabilitation Project or even just the Hoover River Dyke. Um, it is, it's a, essentially a urban uh, dam or dike around the lake uh, of the Lake of the Children. Within it has several culverts for water delivery um, and, and water and relieving the water level within. The lake. 
And so a, a portion of this rehabilitation project involves both insights and repair. So most of these structures were installed back in the 40s or 50s and uh, 60s and have essentially been dilapidated. So over the past several uh, years, the Army Corps of Engineers as well as the state of Florida have worked to repair and rebuild these. Also, the levee since it was built back in the uh, 30s, 40s, it's, uh, you know, some portions of it are uh, great, so there's been levee improvements as well. Um, you know, in the, in the world of restoration, we live in the, the, the terms of contract. So the last construction contract, the last component of this project that was issued uh, this year, um, the, initially this was all 100% federal funded. So the Army Corps of Engineers is their budget mechanism for funding the rehabilitation and uh, levy improvements. Uh, the state, however, has contributed a large component of that funding recently and actually helped expedite a lot of this construction. And so that's why we're able to issue that last um, construction contract this year was because the state took a, a large portion of money to rebuild this, this, this strategy. And then uh, once the, the final construction is done, we're able to focus on altering um, or adapting management of water levels within this lake because it is a managed system. And so um, right now, the Army Corps of Engineers in concert with their local partners in the city of South Carolina, our Department of Environmental Protection and others, uh, we're actually starting to, fit, to put together a plan to revise the operation of the, of the lake. Now let's get into some data. So this is flow data uh, broken up north, south, east, and west of the lake. Here, here you see the lake in the middle. The north involves uh, all these blue dots. West, uh, these three guys. South, the green. And then east, that little red green dot. So you can see right away um, that the, and, well, I'm sorry, the, the, these figures are set up so that blue is uh, and positive is going into the lake, red and negative is going out of the lake. And so now that you know that, <laughs> for some context, um, you can see that a lot of the water comes into the lake via the north. And one, another thing to note, these scales and these figures aren't all identical. So you can see a large portion of the water comes into the lake via north of the lake. A lot of it goes out the west of the lake, but also south and east. And west and east uh, discharges are to those uh, estuaries that uh, we Historically, the water hasn't really flown that way and, and due to water management and uh, man-made tinkering uh, has resulted. So here's another way to look at things. So the top plot here is uh, total outflow from Lake Okeechobee and the red uh, dots and blue dots mean something. So the red or the blue dots are the three highest flow years. The red dots are the three lowest flow years. You can see in these pie charts here, the ones on the left are the high flow years, while those, the ones on the right are the low flow years. And you can see during those high flow years, um, the western uh, section of Lake Okeechobee uh, discharges to the west. And that's just because uh, the capacity of that area is higher. Um, some of it goes out east as well. So east, like for instance, in uh, 1998, uh, a large portion of east and west, very little south, and of course, none of it is north. Now, during those drought times or those low years of, of flow, the water distribution is a lot different. And you can see that um, during those low years, the south uh, discharges, discharges to the south are actually a lot higher because they're trying to feed the other way a little bit of water, given to the FDA. Um, and there's actually some that go a little bit more through some of the, the tributaries there. So it's, it's not all water going everywhere at the same time. Regardless of what of conditions, there are sometimes when flow goes one way, sometimes flow goes another. Along with that water comes uh, phosphorus flows. So you can see here these figures are set up just like the last ones, where blue is positive uh, coming in, 
the red is negative going out, uh, north, south, east, and west. And you can see that the majority of the load, um, and again, these scales are all different. The majority of the load comes from the north. Historically, there has been some back pumping from the south, so water going from the south to the agricultural area to the north. Um, but most of the, of the phosphorus either goes east, west, or south. Most of the stuff. And since uh, here's, a, here's another map kind of showing Lake Okeechobee, there's an Everglades agricultural area. And here are several projects identified uh, for water quality improvement including the stormwater treatment areas, the green areas, as well as other infrastructure such as flood utilization basins or small reservoirs um, you know, that provide flow to the SDAs in the room, um, as well as new SDAs, new, new stormwater treatment areas, expansion areas, and as well as conveyance areas as well. So ultimately, all the projects at least identified here um, and within some of the documents that aren't actually as highlighted on this figure are, should be constructed, will be constructed by 2025, which is uh, right around the corner. Um, so most of these projects are operational, some are under construction, and very few actually under design because most of them are still constructed. Now, looking at some of the data, here's uh, a very busy plot, I apologize ahead of time, but essentially, all right. This is outflow, total phosphorus flow rate and mean, which is as far as all. Uh, and we also have phosphorus uh, retained by the stormwater treatment area from the beginning all the way to the most current. And you can see uh, these dots up here are essentially the years that these facilities have come online. So those, those green areas that I showed earlier, they weren't all constructed all at once. There are piece of those because uh, funding you know, manpower essentially. But regardless, you can see that uh, flow rate of mean concentrations leaving those SDAs going to the Everglades protection uh, area, uh, Everglades ecosystem, you know, have been low, there was a little bit of a rough patch because of storms and drought, and then it's coming back low. And again, this is uh, Irma year, so things are going to be a little crazy. One thing to really look at too is this percent retained. Total phosphorus retained within these SDAs range from about 60 to about 85%. So 85% of the water that's coming in with phosphorus in it is being retained. The phosphorus Great. And to date, we've had over 2,000 metric tons retained within these SDAs. These SDAs um, cover about uh, 5,000 acres of treatment with more treatment areas being, or more area for treatment being constructed. Here's another way to look at that in versus out situation. So the red line is inflow load, the blue line is outflow load, and you can see that that gap is, is widening um, significantly. So like I said, to date, 2,604 metric tons of phosphorus has been retained. Uh, within these SDAs. Now, to put that in the context, um, you could put it in the terms of space shuttles. Because it's Florida and because we have a, a space industry here, I figure we figure out how many metric tons of phosphorus equates to a storm uh, or a space shuttle. And what's really cool is uh, it's about 35 space shuttles. So uh, that's about a one and a quarter space shuttles per year since the operation of the SDAs. That's a, that's a lot of phosphorus. Think about it in terms of spatial. So, diverting back to project wise, um, another project that has gained uh, significant momentum is the EAA storage reservoir, the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir, um, sometimes, sometimes called uh, Senate Bill 10 Reservoir, sometimes called the A2 Reservoir. Regardless, it's a reservoir of storm water uh, within this uh, south of Lake of the Children to help alleviate some of those discharges to the estuaries. Here's still more treatment area three, four, and two. Um, there's a, a flow utilization basin that's existing on the ground today. And then this is what's essentially going to be the footprint of the current um, reservoir and estuary component. Currently design and engineering is in the way. Um, we're expecting the Army Corps of Engineers to also help in review 
extinguisher when building the existing building with the expected completion of 2026 to 2028. And the reason why it's going to take so long is because this uh, reservoir isn't tiny by any means. As you can see the scale here, this is zero, I think, to one. No, zero here to one mile. So this is going to be a, a pretty good stretch of area, um, providing over 370,000 acre feet of storage uh, and, and definitely some thought contributed contributed to the summer. Another project uh, that I want to highlight is this uh, Lake Hikachi Hydrospheric Restoration Project. Lake Hikachi is actually a tiny lake that uh, historically was there and was historically never connected to it, but it is. Um, but it is now today because of uh, what we've done. Um, lake Hikachi is an underappreciated lake, I feel. And so it, it gives me great pride to be able to highlight this project. So this green area here is essentially a, a tiny reservoir, low equalization basin. That's during the wet season, we're able to capture some water and uh, kind of attenuate some of that water during the wet season into the Kikuchi, providing some hydration. Um, this, this green area here is actually completed construction. Um, and the funding for this red spot, this is phase two, is actually uh, acquired or secured, as you can call it, and planning is on the way. Now the benefits, like I said, to this of this tiny footprint project is that it's going to hydrate this lake, which is a very interesting ecosystem in itself. Provides significant storage during that wet season and improves the water quality. It's, it's wonderful. Another project that some of you may have heard of is the C43 Reservoir. So uh, to orient you, here's Lake Okeechobee, Lake Hikuchi, and that little project there. There's some distress water management projects that we talked about earlier. And this here is uh, the footprint of C43. Uh, the city of Cape Coral is here, the city of Port Myers is here, so for a quick perspective. Um, this project is ongoing. Uh, construction. Uh, the final construction contract is issued um, for a pretty good pump station, a pretty good size pump station, as well as some levy work. We really expect completion of uh, 2022, which is um, again right around the corner. Now, the benefits of this project is, of course, some of these storage because it is a reservoir, and it's, um, it's going to help shave off a lot of those high flow events, about 12%, uh, based on the model. And so, the high flow events happen during the wet season. Um, and also, so an added benefit to this project is the fact that you need to um, Real quick, here's uh, three plots. The scales are actually all, uh, all uniform. So here's the S77, the C33 basin flow, and the S79 flow. So this S77 is from Lake of the Chone. This is uh, the basin going into the Pusatake River, and this is actually the extra lake. And going into the estuary. And you can see from year to year things are so chaotic and it goes up and down. But you can see the flow from Lake Okeechobee is actually a very small component of the overall flow going through the estuary. Um, and locally, this is significant because, uh, for instance, on the news, they focus on this component of, of the discharges from Lake Okeechobee rather than also contributing to this. The C43 basin in and of itself contributes a significant amount of uh, flow as in stormwater runoff and fish runoff, but also nutrients as well to the estuary. And last year, for instance, we, we got hit with a pretty good algae bloom, uh, probably made national news, uh, where large portions of the river, uh, the freshwater portions of the river, had blue green algae blooms. Uh, Mechanism, all that kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of people are contributing this component to it rather than looking at the, the uh, ecosystem or the watershed in its entirety. And the reason why I bring this up here's another way to look at it. So here's uh, May 1st, 2017, all the way to April 30th, 2018. This plot is actually a flow. And you can see the different colors. So Lego could show the uh, outflow or flow is the blue. The pinkish color is the, the basin runoff. 
and then that uh, yellowish color is the title basin. And so here's Lake Opportunity, here's the title area, the title basin, and then here's the watershed that you see the water. You can see that tropical storms can definitely contribute. Uh, that's the amount of flow. And for instance, Hurricane Irma uh, contributed a significant amount from the basin itself. Very little came out of the lake during that period. Later on, when the lake filled up because of the delay in flow coming down the system, you can see that um, you know the flow picked up a little bit. But most of that flow, about 45% of it, was from the basin itself, along with that water, some spots or some ice. About 58% of that uh, of the phosphorus going to the estuary was contributed from the basin itself, and then about 40 from from uh, like Another way to look at this is over a, a longer period of record. So here's a five-year average of flow from the lake. To, from the basin and then to the estuary. And you can see that the load five year average is actually uh, pretty high for uh, the, the basin here. About 50% of that load over the five year period is, is uh, contributed by the basin itself. And that's significant. So, here, real quick, wrapping up. So, restoration, the whole idea of it. In, in terms of Everglades, essentially, is we want to increase our wetland area, reduce our stormwater runoff, and improve the timing and distribution of water through those series of projects or project types that I talked about. We have significant amount of storage uh, and a variety of options. Uh, it's almost like a carte blanche menu here. We have dispersed water management, uh, aquifer storage, and recovery and reservoirs. Each of those are being implemented to be able to contribute to our storage. And then, of course, the treatment. Ultimately, we want to reduce that nutrient concentration from stormwater runoff and attenuate uh, the water, which uh, through those flow utilization basins, which provide uh, water quality benefits. I want to thank you for joining me here today, uh, talking about the Everglades and some components of water quality. If you have any questions or want to chat, feel free to drop me a line in the email. Julian at usl.edu. Hit me up on Twitter at Thompson Paul. And also, if you want to get a PDF copy of this, you can find it here at, uh, on my website. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you around.